Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. Uh, I thought today I would talk about uh, 10 essential World War I books. I've talked a lot about uh, World War II on the channel, but World War I, II is endlessly fascinating to me. So here are 10 books that I think are really, really good, and every serious student in World War I should read at one point or other. Uh, first up is The First World War by Martin Gilbert. Now this is just a, a narrative of the Great War. It kind of covers from the beginning to the end. It uh, really does a good job of, of kind of shifting from kind of the, the big strategic decisions high up to kind of just what it's life's like for those guys fighting uh, in the trenches. Um, it, it does a good job of just illustrating exactly how the war moves on. It is also a sense of, of pathos permeates the book, a sense of regret permeates the book. Um, but it's just a good, solid narrative history of World War I, and so I highly re uh, recommend you check out that book there. Next up is Tannenberg 1914, Clash of Empires by Dennis Showalter. Now this book is a very good look at the um, that, that iconic German victory right at the beginning of the war, two Russian armies kind of barreling toward East Prussia and how the German 8th Army is able to effectively stop them. Um, it's very well done. There's some, there's some really good stuff in here. Of course, uh, 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 Dennis Showalter, who's a brilliant historian. I had the pleasure to meet him a few years ago b before he died. Um, super nice guy. Very nice guy. And I've liked a lot of his books. But I like this one, too. He talks about, of course, Max Hoffman, the operations officer for the... For the uh, uh, Eighth Army and and kind of the you know the, the legend the story that supposedly he saw uh, Samsonov and Renan Kampf in, in 1905 arguing and he knew that that's why they wouldn't work together during the East Prussian campaign uh, he kind of goes into that and, and looks at that a little bit but 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 critically too he just it just kind of paints this really good picture of the battle of East Prussia um, prior to the war and then it, it gets into a very um, I want to say a, a, a very technical um, uh, kind of account of how these this war unfolded and how these armies moved forward. But I say technical, but it still manages to capture a humanity and a a, a sense of atmosphere. So it it, it balances that quite ru quite well. And shows just, you know, these, you know, Hindenburg and Ludendorff and their contributions. And as I say, Samsonov and his regret and his, his suicide after the battle. It's a very, it's, it's a very, like I say, a very strong technically written overview of the battle. But it still has that humanity to it, which I really appreciated. So that is um, Dennis Showalter's Tannenberg 1914 Clash of Empires. Uh, check that one out. Next up is Jeffrey Warrow's Sons of Freedom, The Forgotten American Soldiers Who Defeated Germany in World War I. Uh, now, I should point out uh, Jeffrey Warrow, the author, was my doctoral advisor in uh, the University of North Texas. Um, but this is a very good book. Essentially, Dr. Warrow points out the military contributions of the American Army in World War I. Typically, a lot of times when we hear about the Americans in World War I, we kind of tend to think of them more in terms of the... Um, the, the production that they brought and the morale boost that they brought. And he's saying there's a strong case to be made for uh, the um, actual military efficacy of the American Army in World War I and the incredibly important role they played in that conflict. Essentially, he talks about the, the, the rail system that the Germans had established to feed their front line, and as soon as that was in danger, that's kind of, that's kind of why the Germans were, were, were holding on at that line to protect it. And as the Americans, of course, are moving, moving closer and closer to uh, that line, uh, along with the other allies, of course, but, but the, the Germans feel threatened, and when they feel they cannot hold that line, uh, they know the game is up. But he does a great job of detailing uh, saint Mihail and the Argonne Meuse offensive, and, and really kind of, you know, for instance, George Marshall, who the future chief of staff of the United States Army in World War II, the logistical work he did to kind of redirect the... Um, the thrust of the Sammy Hill offensive into the Meuse Argonne offensive. Um, very good. But he also points out some of the problems they had. For instance, um, Marshall uh, wanted to, uh, he had been with the 1st Infantry Division. He wanted that division to have the honor of taking Sedan, but it was positioned wrong. So essentially he has them literally march across the front line laterally um, toward to get in a position to take Sedan. But as he's doing that, I mean, if the Germans had attacked right at that time, it would have been pure chaos. It would have completely disrupted the line. It would have been absolute um, 
as I say, chaos. Uh, so the, the, the American army was learning in that war how to conduct a modern war. Very good, very well done. He also points out that Blackjack Pershing was a great kind of political general. You know, he, he insisted that the American army fight as an American army and not subordinated to British and French armies. But at the same time, he wasn't necessarily a really good um, battlefield commander. And, of course, they talk about all the... the, the uh, American officers being terrified of being blueyed, essentially losing their command and going to Bloich for reclassification. Great book, highly recommended if you want to know about the American Army and the military contribution it made in World War I. That is uh, Sons of Freedom by Jeffrey Warrell. Next up is Peter Hart's uh, The Great War, a Combat History of the First World War. This is a book that, again, talks about all of the uh, belligerents and kind of gets into... Um, what happened during combat, essentially what the, I mean, it details the whole war, but he really gets into the nuts and bolts and a lot of the, the primary documents about uh, what it was like to, to fight in this war and these men and, and uh, you know, their, their, their accounts of the time of, of what was going on and the, just the sheer fear. And uh, the, he also talks about, too, the, how, how different sides in the war were experimenting with different tactics. They tend to think it was just these big pushes and that was it. But he talks about, no, you've got, you know, kind of the, 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 the kind of uh, curtain artillery, uh, flowing curtain uh, artillery, uh, how, how that, uh, you know, was, was intended to prepare the way for the troops to move forward and the different experimentations they made. But as I say, it's, it, it's really about kind of the, the, these, these people fighting in the war. And there's this just heartbreaking moments like there's a letter from a, a captain named uh, Captain May in the British Army on the eve of the Battle of the Somme and he writes this letter to his wife saying you know I, 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 this may be the last letter I ever send to you and I hope this is just kind of in years to come this is just kind of this fleeting thing we don't we kind of laugh about he says but you know it could be the last letter and he says you know I love you I love our baby so much and I know whatever else happens you would have me do my duty it's just this heartbreaking letter and then of course you find out he died the next day along with you know 20,000 other uh, British and uh, and uh, Empire soldiers in that in that push it's just heartbreaking but it's a good book a good overview of men at war men in combat that is Peter Hart's uh, uh, the Great War combat history of the First World War next up is Alistair Horne's Verdun the Price of Glory this is a great book about the Battle of Verdun which was of course the one of the bloodiest battles of the war an apocalyptic battle of the war in which the Germans kind of fixed the French position that they knew the French would not give up that they had to defend and so they just poured men there and of course the French had to defend it and the, the, the French had uh, 12 forts, the Germans take two. Some of the, the, the accounts he has of the, taking the forts are quite interesting. The, the one, the Germans, it's just pure surprise. They just kind of go in and take this. The French were not expecting them, and, and they just kind of march in and take it. Uh, they talk, I think it was Fort Beaumont or Domont, I can't remember, but then there was the Fort Vaux, and, and that fort only falls because they run out of water. The French run out of water. <clears throat> Some re really good accounts there. Good accounts of, of the leaders, you know, that, that, that were trying to hold them back. Patan, and then, you know, the, uh, from the German side, the Crown Prince. And it's just a very good and interesting and solid work of, of detailing this just horrific battle. Very good book. That is uh, Verdun, The Price of Glory by Alistair Horn. And any, anything Alistair Horn writes is worth reading, just to be sure. Next up is Enduring the Great War, Combat, Morale, and Collapse in the German and British Armies, 1914-1918 by Alexander Watson. This book is all about the man in the trenches experiencing firsthand what that fighting was like. This is, of course, a very, it's a brutal book. You know, it's a, it's a brutal book about what kind of, of, what they went through, but also to what these governments and these armies did to kind of inculcate in their troops this sense of purpose and this this willingness to go on to keep living in the trenches and keep fighting um, even when things seem just hopeless and horrible and one of the things that, that's interesting here is they kind of have this attitude this idea that the um, the men in the trenches would frequently have uh, and that was the idea that they were um, 
they would kind of say, you know, I don't need to worry about living through the war, or surviving the war, if I can just survive this week, or if I can just survive this day, or if I can just survive this hour. And they just think, okay, just think that far ahead. If I can just get through this day, I'll be okay. If I can just get through these next couple of hours, I'll be okay. And, and that was something they, they, they really clung to, you know, because the idea of trying to survive the whole war just seemed like, I, we, how can you do that, you know? It was a very, very, it's a hard book to read um, because you just, you just feel so much tremendous empathy for these, for these men on both sides. But, you know, it's, it's it, absolutely fascinating. Very good book. That is Enduring the Great War by Alexander Watson. Next up is The Kaiser's Army, The Politics of Military Technology During the Machine Age, 1870 to 1918, by Eric uh, von Boyce, I believe. Uh, essentially, what this book is about is how the Prussian German army uh, was changing in the years leading up to World War I because of the technology. Essentially, you had, of course, the Junkers, the Prussian Junkers, who were very much wedded to tradition. And, you know, the, the people leading the army must be a better class of people, a better breed of people. But unfortunately for them, technology was changing so rapidly that it was really the, tech, the technocrats and the technicians that were going to be able to run the wars. And because of that, um, they needed to kind of seed you know, some power, some control over the war, over the army, and they wouldn't do it. And so there was this tension between kind of these, these new thinkers that say we need to embrace not just the technology, but the, but the technocrats that are going to run it, and then kind of these people who are hanging behind saying, no, we're, 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 we're going to run things the way we always did. And of course, this tension, which is found in many different armies, right? You could say something similar was going on in the, in the, uh, Navy, American Navy in World War I between battleships and carrier proponents. But here it's, it's rooted in this idea of class. And he does a very good job of showing how those class distinctions played into really dampening Germany's military readiness. Germany was a fantastically, uh, uh, it, was a, it was a very good instrument. It was a very good tool. The German army was a very good tool and it did a very good job for what it was when war broke out but it could have been much better and, and you know arguably perhaps it could have won that's a what if but um but it was kind of this slowness to to adopt change now fortunately for the germans you, you do have similar things going on in, in in the other belligerent countries in france and britain they're kind of having these same kinds of problems but in germany uh it is, is the focus of this book is in germany and again it's done very very well so that is the kaiser's army by eric boisch Next up is Warland on the Eastern Front, Culture, National Identity, and German Occupation in World War I by uh, Vegas Lulivicius. Now, this book is about um, how the German army was attempting to model the, the, it was attempting to create in these Eastern lands that it, that it, that it took in Poland and, and uh, Belarus, etc. Uh, it was attempting to create in these lands a model German state. They were essentially attempting to create this, this very orderly state. And what is really fascinating about this book is the, 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 the state that they were going to create really looks like those, those states when you think of, of what the Germans were going to create in World War II in the East, that they were going to carve out in the East. Those ideas of um, Lebensraum and uh, you know some of the kind of the, 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 the way the SS was going to order things in the, in the East in the in, uh, those eastern territories. This is kind of the same thing that, according to Lilavicious, the German army was actually going to do in World War I. They, they had this very strict idea about how they're going to organize the state, and it comes across as seeming very dystopian. And again, they didn't have a lot of room for certain ethnic groups like the Jews. Who... Um, this is a very, very good book uh, about exactly what the Germans were planning to do for the East. It gives us a good idea of maybe what uh, a German victory would have looked like in World War I. It probably would not have been this kind of relatively benevolent, somewhat liberal German monarch, monarchic state. It would have been something probably resembling the Third Reich. Um, if maybe not quite as extreme, then you know, perhaps approaching it. But a very good book. This is Warland by Vegas Lulavicious. Next up is Christopher Clark's The Sleepwalkers, How Europe Went to War in 1914. This is, again is another good book about essentially how the war began. Now, Clark is saying assigning blame. Who's to blame? Germany, Britain, Russia? 
that's not important if you want to understand how it happened. And that's kind of his main idea here is how did Europe go to war in 1914? And he kind of starts with a, with a coup that took place in, in Serbia, which kind of oriented it from a more kind of pro-German um, disposition to a more pro-Russian disposition. Um, and then it, it kind of takes that and, 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 it, and it goes with it. And he examines in each country the decision-making processes that were going on. And one thing that's interesting is when, when, he, when he looks at these different countries, he, he doesn't just say, well, Germany was doing this, and France was doing this, and Russia was doing this. He kind of says you have to look at these countries are not monolithic. You need to look at the different people. You need to look at the, the, the government leaders. You need to look at the, the aristocrats. You need to look at workers. You need to look at the press. Um, you need to look at, at all the different strata of society because they're not the same and the nations weren't monolithic and they all somehow played a part in, in these decisions to go to war in 1914. And it's a very complex way to, to look at the war. I wouldn't recommend this is a book for just somebody who wants to smarten themselves up uh, when they you know want to learn more about the war, but, but this is really a, a considered war, work about exactly how the war began. But one of the other things too is they, they, he talks about, he kind of says something like, uh, um, you know, Germany, he kind of says, you know, Germany, it was being denied its place as a great power. It, it, you know, Britain and France were constantly kind of holding Germany down because they were kind of afraid of it. They didn't want it to, to have its proper share of, of, of you know, the imperial spoils around the world. And yet Germany kind of, for a long time, almost kind of willingly accepted this to prevent a war. But then ultimately when, um, when the time came to, uh, you know, go to war, that was really Germany kind of saying, look, we're, we're gonna accept our place um, as a great power, and we're not going to be denied anymore. And that's it's, uh, there's a lot more to it than that. But, but anyway, this is a fun interpretation of how the war began. Uh, very well done. And, and again, if, if, if you, you, you are somewhat, you know, if, if you have read somewhat about the beginning of the war, this is a great place to kind of give you a deeper level understanding of that war. That's Christopher Clark, The Sleepwalkers. Finally, the last book I want to talk about is probably one of the most um, well-known and well-regarded books on World War One, and this is Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August. Now this book is very good. Again, it's about the beginning of World War One, kind of the diplomatic crisis that led to the war, and then kind of the opening moves militarily of the war. But, but she makes some good points that there were some fundamental things that these different nations and people got wrong about the nature of war. And for instance, she mentions that um, uh, one of the things that, that they, they continually got wrong is this idea that, that, that any war that breaks out uh, would necessarily be a shorter war. Any war that broke out would necessarily be a war that, that the economies just couldn't sustain it because of how much you had to go through and any war couldn't last that long. But, but even then she says, you know, it, it's so unlikely a war is going to break out. You know, these people were thinking that it's so unlikely a war is going to break out because trade. We've got free trade. We're trading with each other. You know, we were these great trading partners. Germany and, 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 and England were great trading partners. We'll never go to war. We're trading. And that was a, another failed assumption. And then, of course, when the war breaks out, there's this failed assumption of, well, we, you know, the reason why the, 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 the French lost in, in the Franco-Prussian War was the, the, the Germans were just more aggressively minded. So we just need to be more aggressive. So every army has this idea of, of aggression and, and, and the attack and the offense is better than the defense. And you have, of course, the... The Germans had the Schlieffen plan, but the French had plan, uh, was it 14 or plan 17? I can't remember the name of the plan. But they had that plan, and they, you know, part of that plan was Elan, attack, attack, attack. And everybody's thinking, oh, attack, attack is, is the way to win, attack is the way to win. But, of course, machine guns change all that, and, and it leads to disastrous consequences. But it's a brilliant analysis. This is one of the truly great books um, on World War I, of course. John F. Kennedy read this book uh, just before the Cuban Missile Crisis, and supposedly it, it, you know, affected his judgment about how to move forward, uh, lest we get into a third world war. Um, but it, it's an absolutely fast, fantastic book, and I and I can't recommend that enough. So that is Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me for this uh, book look at uh, 10 essential books on World War I. Um, again, I'd ask you to please subscribe to the channel. And uh, if you uh, do like uh, board gaming, tabletop gaming, and war gaming, check out my other channel, thediscriminatinggamer.com. Thank you once again for joining us, and uh, maybe I'll be back with some more of these lists uh, before too long. Bye-bye.